Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And you're about to hear one of my Genius Network interviews. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And I hope you find it very useful. If you want to find out more information about some of the interviews and resources that can help you in your business, you can go to www.joepolish.com. And we have a Joe Polish Recommends section with all kinds of resources and vendors and services and products that we recommend that can help you in your business. And also for more useful interviews and a whole list of other people that I've interviewed, you can go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and enjoy the interview. What you're about to hear is a very special interview that I'm doing with Mr. John Carlton. John is a world-class copywriter and someone that has made millions of dollars for his clients, but is not someone that is on the book market or the seminar circuit. He's not somebody that goes out and tries to become famous. He's actually one of those people that you'll rarely ever get the opportunity to hear his advice, and I'm now going to present that to you on this special two-part series. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background on who John is, just so you'll know how powerful the information that John is going to share in this interview actually can be for you. Gary Halbert, who many of you may know if you study marketing, who's one of the most well-known copywriters in the world, has this to say about John Carlton. When asked, who is John Carlton, Gary says, nobody ever asked me who the best copywriter is anymore because everybody knows the answer. It's me. The question I am now most often asked is, who is the second best copywriter? And although there are a handful of world-class contenders, I have to give the nod to John Carlton. Here's why. John is a master of what I call muscle writing. He can write a brilliant ad on any subject, no matter how complex, technical, or difficult, and make it easy to understand as well as writing it in such a way that it's as impossible to stop reading as a Damon Runyon or Mickey Spillane novel. John is the all-time champ, a hard-boiled, get-the-job-done, grab-them-by-the-throat, and force them to order copy. And that quote was by Gary Halbert, who's the world's best copywriter in September of 1998. Now here's the story on John Carlton. Like most of the best writers in advertising, John is a complex man. He loathes publicity and limelight, like I mentioned earlier, yet performs on stage as a lead guitarist for local bar bands as a hobby. He tried on many different lifestyles growing up and was lucky enough to catch the heyday of Beatlemania, the emerging pop culture of television, hippiedom, the sexual revolution, Watergate, the rise of Silicon Valley, Los Angeles-style decadence during the 80s, and most importantly, the radical changes in advertising that came with computers, cable television, video, and the absorption of junk mail into everyday life. John's involvement with these events is critical to understanding the depth of his experience and knowledge as it relates to advertising and marketing. He took a degree in psychology from UC Davis, a passion for history, a wicked sense of humor, and a youth spent on the edge of Bohemia, and combined it with a powerful writing talent and a feel for what makes people tick to raise the ceiling on what it takes to be called good in today's mean streets of marketing. John scrambled from a loving working class home in tiny Cucamonga, California. Yes, it's a real town. He was the first of his tribe to attend college and has lived all over the country, working variously as a cartoonist, fisherman, dishwasher, novelist, and executive. He says he is proud of his white trash roots. We were the people you cherished as friends and neighbors, John says. His assault on the advertising world started with an old school education in direct mail, typing on an ancient IBM Selectric, creating production art with hot wax and exacto blading galleys of cold type, coaxing colors from layers of ruby lift. Now, nearly everything he knew became obsolete as technology exploded. However, unlike most copywriters, but very much like the best writers, John stayed immersed in educating himself. He's read thousands of books about writing and advertising, and personally, he seeked out the great men of the industry. He went from being the high-paid, hotshot freelancer who L.A. agencies snuck in the back door to write their pieces they couldn't get their staff to pull off, to working on the inside with marketing wizards like Jay Abraham and established copywriters like Jim Rutz. Around 1988, Gary Halbert invited John to handle the big desk chores at his Hollywood office on Sunset Boulevard. And during their long friendship, John has accompanied Gary on marketing adventures that have changed the nature of advertising forever. Now, this is what John has to say. The real test of your marketing proudness, John says, is not your ability to sell refrigerators to Eskimos, but your ability to win over a hostile crowd before they can lynch you. His education with Gary Halbert included convincing famous celebrities to humiliate themselves on camera for obscure ads, telling roomfuls of millionaire executives that their ideas sucked and making them like it, 
saving corporations from bankruptcy with campaigns that they had to whip up overnight and then con them into doing because it ran against every grain of their world knowledge, putting on lavish seminars where people happily paid $10,000 just to glean a few nuggets of advice while Gary and John ranted and babbled and goofed off without a plan, to being slave to insane deadlines. John's never missed a hard deadline in his career in reinventing modern advertising for the age of cable and the internet. John says, We were among the very first to do infomercials, to advertise on the net, and to make videos a marketing industry. He's had fun, had brushes with death, helped small men accumulate fortunes, and watched helplessly as rich corporations came tumbling down from their own idiocy. There's no better way to learn how the world works than to roll up your sleeves and get filthy with experience like this. He's been stupid, smart, lucky, well-off, broke, mocked, loved, and hated, and he's learned something from every damn minute of it. He can identify and relate to every type of customer you'll ever see, and he can sell to them. In 21 years of a prolific career, John has had a hand in selling nearly every product or service used by human beings, including an unlikely sex manual from the conservative Rodale Press. John's sales letter has been the control for three years despite constant attempts by other top writers to do better. A financial doomsday newsletter from the right wing, John's package of paranoia mailed successfully for seven years, dozens of how-to-fight videos from real-life street fighters and Navy SEALs earning millions from a minuscule niche market, driving for longer distant advice from a one-legged golfer with ads that shock the staid golf magazines, plus reams of ads and letters from shrinks, people looking for mates, new computer products, chiropractors, diets, precious metals, fundraisers, and personal letters that have motivated people to change their lives. When John's ads, which often fill three pages of copy, run in magazines, the entire look of the publication quickly changes as other advertisers slowly catch on to his hard-hitting style of raking in profits. His direct mail letters have long been used all over the world as study guides for other writers. In fact, many copywriters secretly come to John for marketing advice and help with their projects. He has a soft spot for helping people because no one helped him when he was struggling in the early years. It's amazing how people can so readily crush someone's dreams, he said. The lesson is, don't look for anyone to cheer your success until after you've arrived. Trust only those who believe in you when things are tough. They are the gems who will brighten your life. College-educated, street-trained, honed by years of intense work in the trenches, John Carlton has quietly earned his place as one of the best copywriters on the planet. While his demand for privacy keeps him out of the limelight, in 1998 alone he turned down over $300,000 worth of jobs from well-known marketers. He prefers to work with a handful of private clients and cherishes his laziness, though on occasion he will take on new work. His fees have caused uninitiated clients to choke, but the results his pieces get have created multi-millions of dollars in profits. Now join me and Mr. John Carlton for a very exclusive interview of a brilliant man that has never been interviewed like this before. So get ready to take a lot of notes. You're going to learn a lot of information. John, thanks for being on the line today. It's a real pleasure to be doing an interview with you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, Joe, here you're fine. Good. You're in Nevada. I'm in Arizona. We're going to be chatting on the phone for a few minutes here, and we're going to talk about how to make more money, increase sales, copywriting, and all those things that you're quite an expert at. They're really um, close to my heart, yes. Before I start, I want to tell the listeners that the term Operation Money Suck, which most of my Piranha clients are very familiar with because I use it in my seminars. I write about it all the time. I think it's a great way to look at how you spend your time and what you focus on. I first heard that term from John, and I heard it when I was listening to a Dan Kennedy tape, which was a tape of John speaking at a Dan Kennedy seminar a few years back. And since I've used it so much, and I think it's such an important philosophy, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on it just quickly, maybe give a short answer of what your philosophy is on Operation Money Suck and where you came up with the term. Could you do that? And then we'll get into the marketing questions. Sure, no problem. First of all, I didn't know Dan was recording that seminar. I wonder if I'm supposed to get some royalties or something from that. Well, you should. It's pretty good. It's about eight years over Just kidding, Dan. (laughs) Operation Money Suck is an interesting concept. I spent some time in the corporate world before I went freelance. So I was working in a lot of corporate offices, and then when I did go to freelancing, I started working with ad agencies, a varied number of different businesses, entrepreneurs, things like that. And the one thing that anyone who's been in the corporate womb notices is that there's just lots of wasted time, mostly in meetings, aimless side projects, studies, a lot of stuff meant to just take up people's eight hours a day while they're there. And one day when I was working with Gary Halbert, We sat down in the morning in his office to try to figure out what we're going to do during the day, and there was a ton of unfinished details happening. I think taxes were due. There were meetings with printers over some screwed-up projects, a problem with the computer. And a lot of these things seemed like urgent fires that needed to be addressed by someone with the ability to sign a check, you know, say yes or no, that kind of thing. 
But Gary insisted that, no, that we would have a very, very long meeting, which took the entire day, and all we talked about was bringing more money in. And in the back of my head, I kept thinking, well, who's taking care of those fires? And then gradually I began to understand that, really, we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. The best thing that we could be doing at that point, at any point, really, was figuring out how to bring the cash in. Cash will solve problems that not having cash creates. And amazingly enough, of course, more than half of those little fires that we had in the morning that seemed so important either went out by themselves or were taken care of by the staff that just finally, out of frustration, made a decision one way or another. And I realized that the offices can run by themselves, that a lot of problems you think are very, very important at the time really aren't that important when you consider how important it is to keep the business alive. And a lot of times the people who are really the only ones with the capability and the understanding to bring the cash in, which is what you're in business for, often spend the majority of their time dealing with things that they could either delegate, ignore, or put off until they're taking care of their number one job, which is bringing in money. So the whole idea of Operation Money Suck is kind of like a war term. It's like landing on the beach on Normandy. Once you land on the beach at Normandy, your job is to survive, get past the gunfire, and take out the machine gun. It isn't to count bullets or to make sure that everybody landed safely or anything. Even though those seem like very, very important things to do at the time, you have one job to do, and you should stay focused on that. Actually, that's very good. I mean, I love what you said about having cash will solve problems that not having cash creates. Very true. And so good. Thank you very much for that definition. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, okay, let's get into the marketing questions. You are great at this stuff, and so there's a lot of things I'd like to speak with you with, and we'll cover as many things as we can in the time we have available. One of the first things I want to talk to you about is how do you research a product or a service before you write copy about it? What is the procedure that you go through? I know you've done all kinds of promotions and campaigns you've created for all kinds of various different products or services. So how do you go about it? What's your operation mode? The way I like to think of myself is as a sales detective rather than a copywriter because what I do is I often go through the same stuff that everybody else went through, but I'm looking for things that kind of leap out at me, little hot buttons that I can then exploit or for sales value or for driving the benefits of the product or service home. Right now, I have a guy that does initial interviews for me. He will call the, I have a client where we do a lot of videos. We'll do instructional videos for golf, say, and we get to golf pro, and then he does a video, and then I have to make an ad that will then sell this very high-priced video to a golf audience. So I will have an associate of mine make the first calls to the guy who did the golf pro in this example. Right. And also make calls to people that he has given names for who will give testimonials about how good he is. So I get a package of information along with the finished tape, and in that information is an interview with the main guy and all these testimonials. This, however, is just raw material for me because I look this over and I look for little hot points, then I call the guy and I interview, and I am always kind of jockeying and listening for those little hot buttons that, like I say, just amazingly seem to elude a lot of other people. One of my favorite examples is a golf product, again, that we did. A pretty basic guy had a good swing, and he didn't really make it on the PGA Tour. He was getting up in age and really was trying to make ends meet by just teaching people these golf secrets. But he was very good. He was discovered by my client, and they did a video on him. And in talking to this guy, who was normal in all respects, he told the story about how he came to his unique teaching method of golf how to hit longer, straighter, with more accuracy. Turns out he was watching a one-legged golfer one day, many, many years ago, bounce up to the tee and just launch the straightest and longest drive he'd ever seen. He couldn't believe that the guy could keep his balance. And he had this epiphany watching this guy and realized that what he was doing standing on one leg was the key to a two-legged golfer to also have that same kind of balance and accuracy and distance. So although no one else talked about this one-legged guy and he kind of dismissed it, we talked about it for just a few seconds, really, just enough for him to tell me the story. It became the thrust of the ad, and the headline was, Amazing Secret Discovered by One-Legged Golfer Adds 50 Yards to Your Drives, Eliminates Hooks and Slices, and Can Slash Up to 10 Strokes from Your Game Almost Overnight. And that ad has been running in Golf Digest and Golf Magazine and various other golf publications and also being mailed for five or six years now. Yeah, probably it's, still pulling in a ton of dough, I'm assuming. It, it still pulls. They have to watch it. They can only run it about three or four times a year. They used to run it back-to-back -back in some of the golf magazines, but they just pull it out. 
it doesn't even have time to gather dust before they pull it out and run it again. And, it, and it, yeah, it's still pulling very, very well. And has created a minor sub-industry for this guy who now makes his money off of these ads rather than teaching willy-nilly as he did before. That's my best example of finding a little tidbit that most people overlook. And, and I had to do detective work. And if I didn't know that I could create a story out of this and that this would be an attention-grabbing device from my experience in advertising, I might have just glossed over it just like everybody else did. So what you're basically saying is the research is a very important prerequisite, even if you're a killer copywriter, because if you don't really research it and find those gems, then it doesn't matter how good you are at writing copy, you still may leave in a very important ingredient out. We call it either breaking the code or breaking the back of the product. One of the things that I do, and a lot of writers do, I think Gary Halbert does it too, is I call it circling the desk. Now, I ask for a certain amount of time to write a piece, anywhere from a week to three weeks to a month. And 90% of that time, I will not touch pencil to paper or tap the keyboard at all or even turn on the computer. That time is gearing up. I call it circling the desk because it's kind of like a dog walking around a circle before he finally settles down to go to sleep. <laughs> I will often turn the computer on and put all my stuff there, but I'm gelling. I'm getting this information and just letting it get in my head. Sometimes I'll sit down for five minutes and just look over a few of the benefits and notes and then go off and do something else and let it sit for a while and come back. And the more time I have, the more I let this process go. So even though I sometimes take a month to write the piece, I'm only spending two or three days actually doing the wordsmithing, and you know the other four and a half weeks is spent trying to break the code. Get that real severe, intense hot button that succinctly defines the whole thing and brings it all home. Yeah, you know what? You, what you just said there, and for people listening, that's why expensive, world-class copywriters like John is charge the types of fees that they do, because they're doing so much more than just writing a letter. I think it's crucial that people understand that. You know, when they hear things like fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars to write a sales letter, large retainers and things, you know, some people are like, well, I would never pay that much to write a letter. They just don't realize everything that goes into it. Yeah. Here's another example. I have a few pieces here. I had a uh, a very hard sell. It was a newsletter from a guy in Arizona, interestingly enough, who was doing a financial newsletter, and he was just ignored by the financial world. Yet his accomplishments were very, very big. And he just, in a number of packages sent out, he just couldn't get his message across. And after spending a lot of time with him, I finally came up with the headline for the piece. And this is the headline, Mysterious Arizona, quote, human computer, unquote, humiliates Wall Street, quote, experts, unquote, for 21st consecutive year. And the key words in the headline is like mysterious. That creates some curiosity there. Why is this guy mysterious? You have to read to find out. The human computer makes the story. The story's already going. Why is this guy mysterious? What's the human computer got to do with it? And the fact that he was humiliating Wall Street experts really taps into our fear of the experts on Wall Street. You know, are they telling us the truth? Can we trust them? You know, can we not? And this guy really did. He's been beating up on Wall Street experts for 21 years, and only a few people knew about him. So that, yeah. that's another example of trying to tie in talking to the guy and getting down to those hot buttons and making them manifest in a succinct way that drives the point home very, very quickly. Great. Okay. How do you come up with a product or services like main benefit, what many of us call a unique selling proposition, to differentiate it from similar products or services? That's a good question. The answer, unfortunately, is pretty simple. It's just you dig. It's always there. Again, the example of the one-legged golfer is there. You can take two Cadillac dealers in the same town. They both have the same product. There's only so much they can do with the price. So how do you differentiate Cadillac dealer one from Cadillac dealer two? There are ways to do it. A savvy marketer wouldn't even have to think about it. He'd sit down, you pick something, either service or location or freebies you give out. or Maybe you go the goofy route, and he's the guy that always has the circus elephants there, you know, or, or some reason. Right. A lot of these things work. But the thing that makes you unique isn't necessarily that your product does something different. It's how you approach the whole bag. It's who you are. There was a famous guy in New York. I can't remember his name exactly, but he was Crazy Eddie, I think, and he sold stereo equipment. And his commercials were famous because he really tried to be crazy on TV, and he got this reputation as Crazy Eddie. And people went there, and they didn't know if they were getting a better bargain or not. He said that you were getting a better bargain. It was because he was crazy, and it was a very believable, quaint, kind of lovable message that he was giving. And the guy lasted for a very, very long time against Circuit City and all these major corporations who were trying to carve him up. Right. 
And of course, with a lot of my clients, I mean, half the differentiation is just merely educating the client because even if you have Cadillac A, Cadillac B, if Cadillac B owner goes through the whole process of actually explaining all the things that they're going to get when they own a Cadillac and the other guy doesn't, that alone is going to create a certain amount of uniqueness to it. If the other guy was silly enough not to say anything, you would swamp him. That's the old story of the first beer. Yeah, the the Schlitz beer story. The Schlitz one, where the guy just said, yeah, it's brewed, you know, in oak casks and aged a certain way. And he made it sound very exotic and desirable. And the fact that it was the same thing that all the other brewers are doing was just not mentioned. And so people thought, oh, I like Schlitz. They take care in their brewing. You know, it's old cast. They could talk about it. It gives them something to talk about. Joe, this may be a good time to bring up my basic philosophy of marketing, which is a way that I explain marketing to clients is I try to make them relate it to romance. You have a relationship with your customer. So it's easy to bring your needs as a businessman home if you just compare every situation and every need you have into a kind of a romantic sequence, like you are wooing the customer. You know, a overweight, bald, ugly guy with no wealth must market himself differently than Leonardo DiCaprio if he wants to find romance. So you're talking about the same more or less target audience. Let's say they both go into a reception or an art gallery, and there's the same audiences there, but they're going to have to market themselves differently to get what they want. It can be done. This isn't, by the way, about making your product or your service sexy. That's not what I'm talking about. I try to get my clients to think about themselves as the wooer and their customer as the wooee. And so they have to make their product fit with the situation. Sometimes maybe you just want the equivalent of friendship, which would be like a $20 buy. Let's say your product costs $19.95 then you're going to approach that in a way as if you were approaching someone to be your friend, more or less, because 20 bucks between friends isn't that bad. So you don't have to hit them over the head to bring them into your fold. Sometimes you want the whole shebang. If you're asking 99 bucks for a product, it's kind of the equivalent of going steady. You've got to get them to trust you enough, to know enough about you, to believe what you're saying, enough that's the equivalent of someone agreeing to go out with you exclusively. Right. And when you're talking about something up in the $5,000 package, say seminars or very expensive tape series or something like that, that's more or less the equivalent of marriage. You've got to have their absolute trust, and they have to have absolutely no question in their mind that this is the right thing to do. Because if they have questions, that's going to be a major objection. It means they're not going to whip out their checkbook. I 100% agree with everything that you're saying. Well, I'm glad you agree. Yes, thank you. Now, you've done a lot of really expensive seminars and everything. Have you ever gone to like a cold list? And I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but Mm -hmm. if I am, just tell me. Have you ever gone to like a cold list that you've not ever sold anything to before and extracted upwards of, you know, $10,000 from people? And when I say extracted, I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I know that the seminars that you've done with Gary and everything, I mean, the information's worth many, many times more than what I personally think was charged for it. The simple answer to that is no. It's very tough to go to a cold list and get that kind of stuff. It's almost like answering a personal's ad in the paper and expecting her to commit to (laughs) a marriage sight unseen. Right. We tried it. Believe me, we tried going to cold lists. The only way to do that, I believe, is to establish a relationship first. And if you're thinking that you're going to be doing, say, $5,000 or $10,000 seminars, let's say seminars is the product that you have, and you're going to have to go to cold lists. Let's say you have a house list or some certain lists that you can go to and know who you are. You can get endorsed mailing. But you know that after the first seminar, you're going to have to go to cold lists to continue filling out your audience. My recommendation would be to start a relationship now. Find some product for $20 or less that you can go to them first and establish yourself with them so that when you ask them for the $5,000 or $10,000 ticket to the seminar, they aren't replying to a stranger. And you want them to be in the position where this is the fourth or fifth letter they've received from you, and it's not, oh, God, here's another sales letter from Joe, but rather, hey, what's Joe up to? Right. It's a great analogy to your whole romance thing because what you said, you know, your only alternative in many cases if you're going to really go for either a quick sale or a very high price sale or something that normally requires a lot of rapport building with people that you can, if there is a way to shortcut it, doing endorsed mailings. But really what you're doing, that's just like a friend that knows you very well and somebody else very well that trusts them introducing the both of you so you can go out together. We used to call that third-party endorsement or Uh, (laughs) bird-dogging. The best way would be to get truthful. I had a woman friend who used to go into bars, this is years ago, and hunt down women that she liked and passed her muster, and she would go up and introduce herself and then introduce them to me. 
Boy, what a gem she was. <laughs> that just took all the nonsense out of it. And women tend to trust other women. There was no competition going on there. And then I wasn't being introduced as a potential guy who's going to hit on her, but whether as a friend of this intermediary. And she got to say a few things about me beforehand, like John's a great guy, you know, he's sincere and friendly, and he's got a few bucks, you know, something like that. That's and good. It, it works wonderfully. So that's the endorse mainly. If you've got to go up cold to somebody, wouldn't it be great if when you walked into the place, a bartender or, again, we're talking about bars as the example, wouldn't it be great if somebody recognized you there and said to whoever your potential customer was going to be, hey, that's Joe Polish. He's pretty well known, you know, in business. He's known as a really straight shooter and a good guy. Yeah. Or wouldn't it be great if they recognized you as you came in and say, hey, I, I read an article about Joe just yesterday. He was in the paper, you know. I'd like to meet him, something like that. It makes the point very clearly. That's yeah. very good. Thanks. Okay, well, how do you come up with the hook or the theme that makes it interesting for a prospect to respond? Or in this case, read a sales letter. Sure, I understand. That's a casual question, but it's really the main point of copywriting. This is what separates the men from the boys in copywriting. I go for the jugular. You want to shock, astound, titillate. Here's a headline I have here that I did for Rodale Press, which is a very conservative, staid, kind of uptight company, which publishes Prevention Magazine and Men's Health and things. And it's really tough. They have a big bank of lawyers and accountants in there, and they're really afraid of shocking everybody. They would rather lose a sale than shock somebody. And... They had a for men only book, which was essentially a sex guide. It was a sex manual, but it was the kind that you wouldn't mind your kid finding in your room. Now, it, was, it was a pretty straight-ahead educational book for men about sex. And the headline I had was, The Astonishing Sex Secrets of the Most Satisfied, Most Knowledgeable, and Most Respected Lovers in the World. And then a subhead is, learn to enjoy the best sex of your life at any age with the amazing secrets and discoveries in this just-released For Men Only book that is dramatically changing men's, parenthesis, and women's, parenthesis, lives literally overnight. And then it goes into Dear Friend. It took a month to get that headline through. The lawyers who were just freaked out about this, they would have preferred that I didn't use the word sex at all, that the idea of these guys as being satisfied or respected lovers, it just went against the grain of their knowledge. But I stood firm, made them do it, and this letter's been mailing as the control for three years. <laughs> and, and there that, you go. What that is is the headline goes straight for the juggler. I dare any man to read just the headline falling out of this envelope and not be tempted to go and find out some more. Anybody I've shown this to has asked to see the book. Yeah, no, that, that's a killer headline, so basically your, your advice is go for the juggler. Now, there's a lot of people, and I disagree with this, you take my carpet cleaners, mm -hmm. where I love using dust mites as, in a lot of ways, an educational tool because people are not aware of them, but a lot of sure. people perceive it as scare tactics, which in a lot of ways it is. You're talking about the blow-up picture? Of yeah. The little, yeah, you know, I big dust mite and a little baby who's crying on who. You know, that really grabs people by the throat. Now, I occasionally will get into some people's arguments, uh, these morality arguments about it's wrong to use scare tactics in advertising, which I think is nonsense. What do you feel about that? I feel you have to judge your audience. Each audience is different. I would not go overboard to the Rodale audience in other words, I fought to get what I wanted, but this is not an R-rated piece for the sex book by any stretch of the imagination. However, every point I bring up, logically, the next step in the reader's head is an R-rated thing, but he has to complete the thought. In other words, all the bullets are succinct and to the point, but they lead you to continue thinking about it. So I let the person go wherever he's going to go. So if he has a block to going to where he needs to go, then he'll go up to a gauzy point or a hazy point and not go any further. It's a fine line you have to walk about shocking, astounding, and titillating. One of the old classy mistakes in advertising, and you'll see this. I'll bet if you pick up a local newspaper, you'll see this in the classifieds, and people do it all the time. You'll be going through the classifieds, and suddenly in big 36-point bold Helvetica is the word sex with an exclamation mark, S-E-X. Right. And then below that immediately starts a copy, which is now that I've got your attention, let me tell you about this wonderful insurance opportunity or something. Yeah, which That's is a stupid. huge mistake. That's a huge mistake to make because you piss the reader off. The only response you're going to get is along the lines of, ah, shucks, you know, that this isn't about sex. And they move on. You know, if you're going to talk about insurance, you have to reach a benefit that has to do with insurance. Right. Now, would you shock somebody into buying insurance? <laughs> I used a headline in a self-defense product. One of my clients also videotapes Navy SEALs and street fighters, and actually a Russian Secret Service guy who defected to Canada. You know, we did some tapes of their self-defense strategies and tactics. Remember, they teach people how to hit and deflect blows and what to do in a situation where you're jumped by three attackers, something like that. 
And one of the headlines I used, I'm not sure I have it right here, but it was, you would have opened the letter and it was personalized. So the letter to you would have said, Joe Polish and family attacked and severely hurt by thugs in theater parking lot. And then I went on to say, dear friend, you know, don't laugh, this headline really could come true. You know, it's the, and then I quoted some statistics by the FBI that shows that one in three people in the United States will know someone or be attacked themselves or something like that. Right. That letter went out and generated a lot of response, and the response was pretty evenly split. Half the people called and bought, and half the people called and, and told these people to never, ever mail them again. They were outraged. Now, some of the people were confused, and, and they didn't understand that it was a personalized headline, so they thought everybody was getting the Joe Polish headline. So they were embarrassed that their name was used in a headline. And once we got that straightened out, we got some people back into the fold. Other people were just outraged. The message was too close to home. Whether or not I need to hear this, they were saying, I resent the fact that you have brought it home in such a vivid way. Right. I don't want to think about me and my family being attacked. And so they got a lot of negative response, but they also sold a ton of product. And they decided a year later that it was worth mailing again. So they did it, but they knew the risk, and they lost a few people again, but they also sold a lot. So it was a calculated risk. How do you actually, would you suggest that somebody makes that decision when they know that they may have a promotion that works so effectively, but at the same time, they know they're going to burn some people? interesting you bring that up. One of the techniques I use with my clients, I call it lipstick on the collar. Sometimes I'll get a call on the phone and one of my clients is just in an absolute panic and he says, John, we got a lipstick on the collar problem. What that means is imagine coming home to your wife one night and you've got another woman's lipstick on your collar. That's a big problem and you've got to really have your chops together to get out of that problem. And this was one of those problems. They were getting a lot of calls. They were doing this. So what I did was to stop the bleeding the first time, we wrote an apology letter. And the apology letter says, recently I sent you a headline that said, Joe Polish and family attack. My secretary has just informed me that you called and were upset about this. And I deeply regret this. And we just groveled and pleaded for forgiveness and tried to do kissy kissy and make up and offered them a free product or maybe it was 50% off the next product or something. Or somehow we tried to make it up to them. And that brought a lot of people back into the fold. They wound up not losing a great number of people. They were able to bring them back with these techniques. The second time they mailed a year later, we sent out a small cover letter before this, which told a little story. And it says, dear friend, I sent this letter out last year and caught absolute hell for it. A lot of people were upset. However, I still feel the message is so important. And this is the way the client felt, by the way. I still feel the message is so important that even if I lose a few people, it's important enough to get out. And what it was, it was talking about self-defense strategies for a man with a family. You know, how to be aware when you're walking through a parking lot, say, from a movie theater at night, or, you know, how to make sure your house is defensible from entry by burglars and things like that. Simple stuff, but stuff that the FBI showed almost everyone ignores in America. Right. So we use two different techniques. There's an old, I think it's a Chinese saying, it's, it is much better to act and ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Right. So the first one was we went ahead and sent it out, not knowing we were going to get this kind of response, but they did. And then we tried to make it up to them afterwards with an apology letter, which also, by the way, brought in more business. Cause, yeah, that's Because not would only did the people wind up buying the first product, but they also, through the freebie, the freebie I think we gave them was an introduction to another product, and that sold a lot. So it, it actually came out very, very well marketing-wise. And the second time, we just sort of apologized as we were doing it. <laughs> wow, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Good. That's a great example. Yeah. How do you create a killer offer? You have to work with the client on this. The Rodale offer is one of the best I've seen. All Rodale does is books, and they have a standard offer. You get the book free for three months. At the end of three months, you will be billed. If you don't want to pay for the book, simply send it back and write cancel on the order. And I said in my piece, I was the first writer to do this too, I said, in essence, you can rip us off. Even if you like the book, even if you read it and photocopied it and had all your friends read it and stuff and you liked it, you can still send it back. But we trust you. We believe so strongly in this product that we believe that you'll do the same thing. Now, I've used that rip us off tactic several times as part of a guarantee, and I'm probably using it too much at the point because I'm so in love with it. But it's the whole concept of a guarantee. A lot of people don't realize what the guarantee means. It means you have a full month or three months or a year, whatever the guarantee is, to look this over, try it, use it, beat it up. I often use in my copy, you know, send it back to us in any condition for any reason or for no reason at all. 
and, and I remove all ideas in their head of, well, gosh, I've got to think of a reason to send it back or do something. No, you remove all of that. So the guarantee has to be rock solid. You can still set a time limit on it, but make it enough down the line where they're very relaxed, not a 10-day guarantee or something. Three months would be the minimum, I would say. And I would like to say a year, and sometimes I say, take however long you want. I've done that a few times. Clients typically get nervous about that. So you need to take away all the objections for doing it. In other words, you're really not paying for it. We're holding your 35 bucks essentially in escrow. And all you've got to do is snap your fingers and just say you want it back. You don't have to give a reason. And all you've got to do is send the product back and send it back in any condition at all. I don't care if you use this book or this video and it's beat up and we can't use it again or you've marked it up. I don't care. It's up to you. We trust you. You're in the driver's seat. So you remove all the objections to shelling out the money because in their minds, they're thinking, I can get my money back, and I still get to look at the spark. I get to satisfy the curiosity in my heart that reading this sales piece has created. How many books a year do they sell? Do you have any idea? Oh, Rodale is the biggest in the country. Uh, millions of books? Yeah. Now, that's as far as taking away the objections. Next, pile on the freebies. Jay Abraham's a master of this. He would sell a seminar for 5000 bucks, and then he would start piling on the freebies with transcripts and cassette tape products and books and compilations of other people's works. And it wouldn't be all J's. In fact, he would go out of his way to have, like you might get a Gary Halbert thing. You might get a report that I had done before and transcripts from a seminar of a competing marketer or something. And he would stop and say how much people paid for each and every product and pump it up. And at the end, when you added up all the freebies, and he would do this for you in the copy, you're realizing you're getting more free, and you can keep this even if you cancel out of the seminar later. You're getting more than you're paying for the seminar. So if you're paying 5000 for the seminar, you're getting $10,000 worth of free material. And he just piles it on and piles it on and piles it on. And each freebie is something that you desperately want. It's a little sales piece for every single item. Right. Now, how do you translate that, though? I know most people that are savvy marketers can easily see the application. Mm -hmm. But to a person that doesn't do seminars, to a person that doesn't sell books, they're in a service business, they sell cars, how do they make that transition into creating the offer? Hmm. I've never thought of this, but the easy thing to do is go back to the romance thing. You can take this analogy too far, of course, and it's only valid for a certain amount. But let's say you're desperate, and this is the woman of your dreams, and you should treat every client that way. By the way, to be non-sexist, can go both ways. It could be a woman with the man of her dreams. But let's say you're desperate for this person, and so you start piling it on. You give them presents. Yes. Good way to look at it. And, yeah. and, what, and what kind of presents do you give them? Now, men, I mean, there's been a thousand sitcoms on this very subject. Men don't know how to give presents. They typically give roses or candy or something like that. The best kind of present you can give a woman, and, and vice versa, but women do this much more readily than men do, is to really get to know the person and give them something that satisfies the desires in their heart. Let's say the client loves dogs. Then you give them a cute photo or a calendar of dogs playing poker or something, just something that will delight them. Let's say the person's a golfer. Then you send them free rack of golf balls, sleeves of Titleist golf balls. For a car thing, I mean, if you're trying to guess what the person wants, well, that's kind of tough. You should be in a position to gather information about your clients so you know a little bit about what their likes are. All you need to know is what two or three lists they're on, and you can get an idea of what they've been ordering. Or if you've got to do them on a service thing, let's say it is a car dealer, a few pointed questions will find out what they do. Do you have any hobbies? What do you do in your spare time? You've got a kid in a little league, you know, something like this, and you can find some stuff out. So rather than the generic candies and flowers, you can give them something much more related to what they're interested in. Let's say you have a car dealership and you're selling those vans that the soccer moms, as they put it, were buying up, sports utility vehicles. I think. Right. Well, it's not hard to get a few ideas of how to appeal to soccer moms. I mean, you make it easy for them to come in so there's maybe there's some child care while they're looking at the cars, you know, or the kids are playing something, or there's a clown there taking care of the kids. So that's a little gift right there. Exactly. Take, the, take them out to lunch and feel confident that their kid is taken care of for an hour while they're out relaxing and they don't even talk about cars or give them presents like um, offer them uh, offer to relieve them while picking up the kids from soccer, you know, for two weeks or something. You know, so you've got a guy running around town picking up everybody's kids and taking them to the soccer match. I mean, you know, that's, I, I'm talking off the top of my head, but well, no, I actually, bring it home. Those are brilliant examples. I mean, it's so simplistic, too. It just requires you to think about it. I mean, like for my carpet cleaning clients, I have a friend by the name of Don Aslett. He's a very successful contracting company. Uh -huh. He makes millions of dollars a year, has a couple thousand employees, you know, has a huge company. And, and one thing he does part-time on the side is he writes books. He's written many bestsellers. He does videos. He has these buckets of different chemicals, of all household chemicals and things. And an idea that I came up with recently, he was uh, speaking at one of my marketing boot camps. 
and he has a video called Clean in a Minute, and it's a video on how to do house cleaning. And everyone that would hire a professional carpet cleaner is interested to a certain degree in the subject of keeping their home looking good. Exactly. And what I'm working with now is cleaners that are taking his videos and using them as bonuses. And I can get these videos from Don in bulk at relatively a low cost where it makes it affordable. And so, you know, my cleaner clients can just have an invitation to have somebody come over and do what we call a carpet audit, which is basically giving a price and putting on a show in the home. And just for inviting them over, they get a free video on how to keep their house clean, even if they hire the cleaner or not. And that's just one of those added on bonuses that would be interested to anyone that would ever call up a cleaner because it teaches them how to keep the rest of their house clean, not just the carpets. And that's something that costs almost nothing compared to what it can do in terms of bumping up your response and satisfying the client and being different than what anyone else does that's in that business. Exactly. And it doesn't have to be a video. It could be a written report. These types of freebies, it should be noted, are what I call information-intensive products, which means that it's not the presentation, it's the information. I liken it again to romance. If you're talking to Claudia Schiffer and she scrawls her home number down in lipstick on a torn bar napkin, that's a valuable piece of information right there. And you don't care that it's written in smeary lipstick you know, on a torn piece of paper. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, if somebody you're not interested in gives you a very nice business card, you know, lacquered and raised thermal lettering and stuff like that, it makes no difference. The information isn't valuable to you. Right. That, <laughs> I love your analogies. They're very funny and they're very accurate. One last thing on the killer offer. The other thing I've been doing a lot is trying to drive home the fact, first I have to work with the client and make sure that we make it a bargain. And then I drive home the fact that you're getting a bargain. And one of the things that people really want is a deal that no one else gets. The best thing that can happen to most people in the country is to walk out and wash your new Lexus car or something, and your neighbor has the identical Lexus next door. And during the conversation, you find out he paid ten grand more than you did for the car. That just raises everybody's spirits. They feel smart. They feel on the inside. They feel like they've gotten a bargain, and they're happy for the rest of the day. So before they buy, let them know they're getting a bargain no one else is getting. If you work with the client, you can talk about if they're on a special house list, you, you tell them, you can't even tell your friends about this deal. This letter has been coded, and the people on the phone will ask you for this code, and no one who doesn't have the code is going to get on. This code is just for your name, too. And you say, I have one of these products, if you're talking about products, I have one of these products in my house right now with your name on it, or excuse me, in my office. It's, I'm looking at it as I'm writing this letter. But if you don't call within 11 days, it goes back to the warehouse with your name off, and someone else will get it you know, at full <laughs> price. And you can get it right now for half price or something like that. So you really drive home the point that they're getting something no one else gets or few other people are getting, and it's a short-time offer. Bring it home. You've got to do it now. Now, with rug cleaners or with other people, that, of course, can backfire for you. So you have to create different reasons to act now, such as season. I just had something in the mail from a guy to clean my heater, and he was giving special half-off rates for having your heater cleaned in the summer, which, of course, is something I'm sure you're aware of. It's just smart. I mean, he doesn't usually have any business in the summer. Now he's created cash flow and a very large business clientele who are getting a bargain by just agreeing with him that, yeah, why not do it now? We're going to live here in the winter, you know, and all these things. And he goes, it's, it's a pretty good small little sales letter. Exactly. And he says, by September 1st, this deal is off. You know, it's no longer summer. So, you know, but, but this is only good till Labor Day. So you got to do it right now. So he gives that little spur. So, so you, you can create a deadline out of thin air. You just have to have a good reason for it. Right, right. Excellent. You had mentioned a couple of really killer headlines, and you're very good at it. Do you follow David Ogilvie's advice on spending 90% of your time writing the headline? I used to, but not anymore. I've done it so much that often I write it last, or I'll write it during the piece or something, or it just comes to me, because generally I have about, I never counted, I'm saying somewhere between five and a dozen templates, uh, boilerplates in my head, which I can fit the concepts into. And I generally, I don't know if you noticed in, in my headlines I read, but if you went back and counted, there would be three benefits in, in every headline. Hmm. And so what I do is, it's a rhythm I've got. It fits a rhythm in my head. So the headlines kind of dance when you read them, and they go into three parts. And it's just, I always give, it was, I think for the golf thing, it was uh, eliminate slices, add 50 yards to your drive, and give you pinpoint accuracy. For the sex one, it was uh, the most satisfied, most knowledgeable, most respected lovers in the world. So for some reason, I settled on years ago, the idea that the three ideas somehow covers enough that you can close in. You can make a triangle with three. With two, you only got a, a line. With three, you can actually surround the client you know, and cover all those different points of objections. Uh, interesting. 
Do you ever put a limit on the amount of words that you would put in a headline? Can you ever overdo it in too many words? You can overdo it. I would suggest to beginners to overdo it rather than underdo it. What I generally do is write a headline and write what I need to write and then start carving it down. Always keep in mind that rhythmic, almost music that it has to fit into. And that usually means that you want to get it into three lines in a letter. I'm a little upset if my headlines go to four lines, although I've done it quite often. Here's one I did for a chiropractor. It wound up as four lines. Who else wants to learn the secrets of earning an extra $96,485 as a chiropractor this year? while working just 24 hours a week or less with minimum stress and zero debt. So that's the three items, earn more, work less, and have less stress. Right. And also zero debt. There's actually four there. But anyway, and it ran to four lines on the headline. And I tried to carve that down and knock things off and do it. And finally, I just said, you know, to heck with it. Once in a while, I'll go to four lines. What that generally means is you're taking up a lot of space. This ran in a publication, so it takes up space and it seems a little daunting. So I generally keep them to two or three lines. And, of course, sometimes I've had one-line headlines. I've had one-word headlines. I've had two or three-word headlines. But generally, I like to make it a sentence, and I like to deliver information, and I like to deliver the information in a way like I'm surrounding the client with benefits and blocking his egress by canceling out his immediate objections. Right. Okay, well, I want to actually talk to you about your process of going through it, but I want to ask you another question first. What I do, I collect tons of sales letters. I have a huge files of sales letters and ads, and I call it a swipe file. And what I wanted to ask you is, you know, when you create these promotions and you write these letters, are you creating things from scratch every time you create a promotion or a sales letter, or are you maintaining some sort of a swipe file? And if so, what do you keep in your swipe file or your reference file or whatever you want to call it? Okay, I have two answers for that. I think a swipe file is a great idea. I don't have one now. I sit down, it's just me and the computer and my notes. But remember, I've been doing this for over 20 years. Right. So a lot of this stuff's in my head. And like, I still work off of boilerplates. I find myself, especially when I'm going to a new audience, it's easy for me to go to an audience who's never seen my writing before because I can pull out all the tricks that I know work. And one of the ways I work is I use this F-then opening sentence. You know, F, if you've ever wanted to be richer than God himself, then this is going to be a very important letter for you to read. So something along that line. You know, it's the F-then idea. And then go to, here's the story. And I often use subheads throughout the piece, such as here's out of order. Here's what you need to do right now. Here's what you're going to learn when you order this product or, you know, when you get this. Right. And so I just make these little lead-in lines that just help me, and, and it's boilerplate. So I can just go, okay, now here's the paragraph of how to order. Here's the paragraph of here's what you get. You know, here's the paragraph of here's the story on the guy. You know, here's the background. Here's why, essentially. That's great advice. I mean, that's simple but very useful. Yeah, and when I sit down to write now, after all these years, I will sit down and write a letter and quit, and I'm at eight pages. I can't explain how that happens except that my mind is just so used to this that I know when I've said enough about a subject. And regardless of what the subject is, you say so much about the story, so much about the guy behind the product, and then you get into the product, you say so much about the product, and then you say so much about countering all the objections you need to counter, and then talk so much about the bargain and the guarantee and then the, the instructions on how to order. And I just invariably come out at the same length almost every time, which is the classic eight-page letter. Well, you know, hey, it's nothing that 20 years of practice won't at least give you a little bit of assistance with. Huh? Let me go back to the swipe file. Again, I think it's an excellent idea. And my swipe file is now in my head, but I kept a thick swipe file when I first began. And what I did... I knew a guy who was on every list in the country, and he used to have this big bin in his office, and I would just go in there, and he'd let me rifle through it, and I'd pull all the packages that I thought were interesting. I'd go home, and I created a verb file, as I called it. And what I did is I just started writing down all the cool verbs, action verbs that guys were using. So instead of, this is the best offer you're going to have, you know, this is the most outrageous offer ever created in you know, God's green earth or something, I'd take out these phrases that guys would use, and it started pumping my vocabulary up. So words like mystery, words like devastation. So I could make my pieces where I was trying to make people kind of afraid so they would buy this financial newsletter. I knew how to drive it home right. in a way. And I had just mounds and mounds of this. And I would keep copies of Mooch Letters, which was where you're typically dealing with people who are only interested in the freebies. So you have to sneak the sale in. I kept copies of Mark Letters, Marks being people who were easy sales. That's usually the house list of the hottest customers. Right. And then just try to build up the outrageous reaches of every emotion, guilt, outrage, fear, greed, suspicion, 
because these are the emotions that become objections. A guy may feel guilty that he's going to buy this Corvette. Well, how do you overcome that guilt? Well, there's ways to do it. You may overcome the guilt by appealing to his greed. People are suspicious of admin. How do you overcome the idea of them just being suspicious from the fact that you're a letter in their hands suddenly they're reading? How do you overcome that? Well, you know, it's pretty simple. You say, you know, I'm not a professional businessman. I'm really just a guy like you. You know, I get really upset when I read letters and with offers like this that don't come out to be true. So I have vowed to treat you like I want people to treat me, and that's why I've made this big, generous guarantee, and that's why the offer is so outrageously low, et cetera, et cetera. Very good. Great. Okay. I love this type of stuff. So what would you say to someone just starting out in the marketing business, just starting to write copy? Is there any suggestions that you have on what they should collect, if there's any magazines they should read, if there's any junk mail list they should get on? Well, don't you have, you have a pretty good file that you send out, don't you? Oh, I yeah, mean, absolutely. Yeah. So well, I think he, collecting your letters is a good way to start. I think you have some deals with Gary Halbert. He's certainly got a lot of collections. A lot of my letters are in other people's collections, and they use them sometimes as templates or as study guides. Halbert's great idea was to take really, really good letters and ads that you knew were good, and you know they're good because they pull. If you're absolutely beginning and you have no idea how to reach anybody to know what a good ad is, look through six months' issues of a magazine. Actually, you should go for a year and take out every ad that's run frequently because it takes three months to place an ad in a magazine. So by six months or nine months, they should know if they're pulling, and they certainly wouldn't go in again unless they were making a profit. Right. So if you can get even a year and a half's worth of magazines, say a year and a half of Mademoiselle or a year and a half of sport fishing, and just get the ads that you recognize, earmark them, tear them out, and because they've been running so often, you know that they're good ads, copy them by hand. This is a Halbert technique. So you're not just reading and trying to do it, but you're viscerally putting it in your muscle memory, what verbs they're using, how they've constructed their sentences, how they've made the story wind together, how they put it together. And that's a really good way to work. And as you come across a line or a phrase or a word or a verb that strikes you as something you want to know, just make a little note of it. Start your little swipe file with just pieces of paper or you know, little stick-it notes or something with hot little things on there. And when you first start out, I would suggest that your office be covered in these little sticky notes and stuff. Or if you, you know, if you want to put them up with a bulletin board, I had a huge bulletin board in my office that I would just tack up stuff until it got too full, and I'd just take it all down, put it in a banker's box, put it somewhere, and then start over again and just start putting stuff up there. Yeah. I've kind of gotten away from that, but you know, I have a quote from Cynthia Heimel on my computer right now. It's just something that reminds me, it grounds me, it brings me back home. Her quote is, when in doubt, make a fool of yourself. There is a microscopically thin line between being brilliantly creative and acting like the most gigantic idiot on earth. <laughs> you know, I just love that. That drives home. That's a problem that I have, is, is being a little too worried about what people will think, when in fact I really don't care what people think. Well, you know, what most people think. Right. And it's a little reminder. Your office should be a place where... The creative juices can run unfettered and willy-nilly and free and go to outrageous places. And also, if you're not willing to tap into that, then you're going to be creating a bunch of mediocre stuff anyway. That's right. At least in the marketing department and pretty much every other area of your life if you're not willing to do that. Joe, you've sat in with meetings with Halbert and me in the same meeting. So you know it gets really wild, and a lot of the ideas and concepts we come up could never be used. They're either impractical, they're going to cause too many problems or whatever, but you've got to go through the wild stuff to get to the stuff that really breaks boundaries down, the kind of cutting-edge stuff. It doesn't just pop in your head, oh, there's a cutting-edge idea, I'll use that. No, you usually get that through a roundabout series of impossible ideas, and then finally you start to hone it down and realize, you know, this one may work. Yes, I agree. Gary's always talking about the fatigue issue of when you get really fatigued. A yeah. lot of times that's when the best stuff comes out because then you're forced into actually having to really think. That's true. I also use David Ogilvie's technique of sleeping on it. One of my tricks to working and working well when I'm writing is to get every trace of sleep out of my body. I can't sit down and be the least bit tired and write well. I don't know how many other writers share this, but I have a feeling it's a lot. So if I have any kind of sleep in me at all, I go and take a nap. But I also sometimes take kind of power thinking naps. I will load my brain with stuff, read everything I can. And before I sit down and start writing, I'll go take a nap. And it may be a long nap. I may be asleep for an hour, two hours, something. I wake up, and I've got every trace of sleep out of me. And my brain has been functioning. So often I will wake up, and I have to have a piece of paper and pencil very close to where I'm sleeping, whether it's on the couch or in my bedroom. You know, I will often just wake up in the middle of this and scribble down ideas very fast and then go back to sleep and wake up. And some of them will be absolute nonsense, but others will be the germ of what I needed. 
using the power of your unconscious, which is a very irrational tool. A lot of people don't like to use things that are irrational, illogical, but when you're creating stuff out of thin air, which is what you do when you create marketing campaigns and invent products and write ads, you're creating something out of thin air. You're dealing in the world of the irrational and the illogical, and you're bringing it home and making those things logical and rational. Yeah, exactly. You are oh, yeah, the bridge yeah. between the, un- the collective unconscious and the here and now. How long did it take you to actually get really good at what you're doing to the point of getting excellent to being you know, a world-class copywriter? Well, I took such a roundabout way of doing it. I lucked out by discovering the library. So when I went on my own, I just went, I took a speed reading course, went to the library and read everything in the racks on, I think it was the 900 Dewey Decimal System, everything from 900 to a 999 or something, which was advertising, writing, sales, copywriting, just that whole section. And I, and I just took every book down and went through them and read them and reread the good ones and discovered by accident the same books that the greats already knew about. You know, Jay Abraham and Gary Halbert came up with the same list of top books that I did. And so I would have these books next to me and use them as reference and just, you know, use them as a crutch a lot. But I was still working in the corporate world. So I was working for advertising agencies when I first went out who had regular clients like MetLife and Cadillac or something, which won't let you be very creative. I mean, they have, they don't do very good direct response mailing. They do more general awareness, they call it, um, advertising. Right. And you can't be very creative. They're afraid of it. So I had, I was stifled for a long time. But I would say, just to answer your question shortly rather than the long way, I thought, I'd say about five years. Five years. Yeah. Good, good.